Well, we are in uncharted waters here today. So uh, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Matt, and uh, I am a pastor, a covenant pastor from Oregon, and uh, was given the opportunity to come up. And so it's fun to be with you. But this is the one Sunday that we've never seen before, maybe in the history of the church in America, where churches are not meeting as a, as a community. And um, as I've been processing this this week, um, in some ways it feels strange because it's not it's not our normal uh, it's not our normal way of operating on Sunday. But there's another part of me that wonders if God's doing something huge. The, the church needs a kick in the pants in some ways, and I'm wondering if this is going to be a movement. And so, with trepidation, we move forward. Um, uh, the, the, I'm scared because I think one of the greatest pieces of church is community and sitting face-to-face with each other, sharing the journey together. And when we are watching sermons online, I think we get God's Word and great teaching, but we miss that. So it'll be interesting to see how God works this out, how the church moves forward, so... Anyway, that's my little intro. So uh, this morning, I, uh, full disclosure, I had a sermon prepared, and at the last minute, I decided to change it in light of the rapidly changing pace or the face of our country over the last couple days. And so it has affected me personally in that I have a son that's away in college and was told that he will no longer be able to stay at the university, like every university in the country now, almost every university. So he is going to be coming home for early uh, and taking classes online. But now the question is, we get him back from Chicago, uh, make sure we get him back safely. So with that said, um, I, uh, I'd like to start uh, talking about faith because I feel like this is a time where many people's faith um, has great potential to be challenged at this time in life and our culture. And so I'd, start, I'd like to start by saying, um, if we ask the hard questions about faith, faith is often associated with things like physical happiness um, or blessing. Maybe you've seen someone put the hashtag blessed after a post on social media. And it points to a culture that has associated God's goodness or God's presence only when things are going well. Only when we feel like we are blessed. Only when we have enough resources financially or our health is good. Um, when things are going, you feel like you're coasting, we t- tend to have tremendous faith. But what do we do when it gets really, really hard? And I thought it was appropriate this Sunday because it's getting really, really hard. And it may get much harder over the next couple weeks and months. Um, I'm sure, just based on statistics, I'm sure you've experienced faithful, God-fearing people that are prayer warriors or have had thousands of people around them praying for them and they still died of cancer at a young age. I experienced this twice in the last couple years, uh, uh, a young woman from our church in her 30s. um, She, after getting remarried with a couple kids, uh, two or three months into her marriage, found out that she had stage four colon cancer. And just an unbelievable human being. And she, um, there were thousands around the world that were gathered praying for her and it's one of those times you ask the hard questions, God, why are you not listening? Same thing with my father-in-law, a faithful, God-fearing man who after uh, a 10-year battle with cancer finally succumbed. And you just ask these questions, God, it's, there's tremendous people that love him and are praying for him. Why did this happen? And our faith can tend to falter. And I'm, I'm here to say this morning that that's okay, because often when that happens, when we get to the edge of our faith, it becomes a time of strengthening our faith. And that's what we're going to see today in the story of Elijah. So with that said, I am going to do something unique today in that I'll give you a point, and then uh, make a couple comments, and then a little application, and then move to the second point. So the first point I want to make today is this. Sometimes our circumstances tempt us to give up. Sometimes our circumstances will tempt us to give up. Now, the backstory. I just, I sense that this is a godly group of people that know their Bibles well here in this room and that are watching on Facebook. Um, but I want to give you a little background. I don't want to assume that you all know the story, but the story of Elijah is, is straight out of a movie. If you could, if you could print it, if you could script it, it is, it would make a great scene in any movie because the story of Elijah, just to recap, is Elijah is a prophet in the, there's two, ter- two kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and he's in Israel. And um, at this time, just prior to this, 
actually a couple of years, he, God had said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the rain because I'm unhappy with the leadership in the country. And so the rain has stopped and it is getting desperate. And then the, the king at the time, Ahab and Jezebel, they do not, they, they have adopted their own gods. They have, they have served Baal, Asherah. And so um, God has said, you have worshiped other gods. And that is very important to me that you don't worship other gods as we know from the 10 commandments. And so I am not going to bring rain. And so for three years, there's no rain and it's getting dire. And God tells Elijah to say, okay, now you're going to go back and I want you to meet with Ahab because I'm going to bring the rain. But I've got some other stuff for you to do. So he meets with Ahab and essentially says, we're going to have this moment where uh, bring your prophets. And if you know the story, it's not 400. There's actually 850 people that come. Although the 450 are mentioned, the prophets of Baal, there's actually 400 from Asherah that are there as well. And they show up and, and, and essentially um, Elijah says, you get to go first. So do what you want. Let's put the bowl on the altar. They, they, they put the bowl on the altar and they, they dance around and they cut themselves. And Elijah, what was so interesting, he actually says, is your God's or your God sleeping? Has he gone on vacation? And then he says, is he using the toilet with great humor? Is he actually using the toilet? Has he gone away and gone on vacation? And then it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah comes up and he repairs the altar with 12 stones. And this is a passage that is chock full of symbolism. Whenever we hear the numbers in the Bible, 3, 7, 12, they're making connections throughout the Bible over and over again. So when you see those numbers, pay attention. So he repairs the altar with 12 stones. And then he covers the altar with water. He gets four large jars. We think, well, four's not really a biblical number, but he does it three times. So then we have our number 12. And then um, also alluding to the idea of, of three days, which we know a story of someone that came back after three days. And then it says, fire from the Lord fell from the sky. And I... I don't know what that meant. Was it lightning? But I, I sensed that it was a bit more because it obliterated the altar. It says it even burned the dust. It turned everything to dust. And then the story goes on and um, people fall on the ground and they cry out to God saying, obviously there's something bigger here than their gods because their gods did not show up. But this God showed up. He hits the ground and they say, the Lord is the true God. They seize the prophets and then, and then he says, the rain is coming. And it rains. So that's where we pick up the story in verse uh, 1 on chapter 19. So when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me this time tomorrow if I have not killed you just as you have killed them. So Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. So it's not necessarily kill me, but take my life. I'm done. See, it's a remarkable story because Elijah had just seen the power of God that we all want to see. We want to see God come in force and just eradicate whatever we need to eradicate or, or heal whatever we need to heal, solve whatever we need to solve in great power. And I don't think it gets much more powerful than a bolt of fire from the sky that, that obliterates a wet altar. So it's interesting that he is he switches from everything was going great to, God, take my life. Uh, well, one way of putting it is Elijah has come undone. He's come to the end of himself. He's come to the end of his rope and saying, I just am so tired. And then he lay, literally lays down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up, eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, he ate and he drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days. 
There's a number again. And 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to the cave where he spent the night. Now, for anyone that read this story after the fact, would have made the connection right away that Mount Sinai is the same place where Moses went and spent 40 days with God as he got the commandments. And essentially what God is doing is I'm reminding you of your past and my promise where you came from. Remember the story where I met with my people, I established my people, and we made this covenant together. I'm taking you back to that place to remind you because I have something for you. And I share that because, and actually in my notes, I had written sometimes when we need God's reminder, and I change it to, we always need a reminder of God's presence in our lives. Not sometimes. We always need to remember the stories not just how he's shown up in our lives, but remember the old stories. Remember the stories of how he has been faithful to his people day in and day out. But then the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I just, and, and God had just performed this powerful feat through Elijah, and he's asking him, what are you doing? And Elijah is just wrestling with this idea of where are you, God? A couple years ago, a film, I did not read the book, but there was a film, uh, the movie Silence. I don't know if you saw the movie Silence by Shushaki Endo. And it's the story of Portuguese missionaries in Japan that are being persecuted. And the story follows two missionaries that go back to find their mentor. And it is, I mean, torture should make us all queasy, but if it, if you can't watch it, it's not worth watching the movie. But the story goes on, it just, it's missionaries that are, have landed in Japan um, or have gone into hiding because the Japanese government has literally just tortured and tortured and tortured. And these two, these two um, students go to find their mentor. And that's the question. The whole movie is they're asking the question, God, why are you silent in these moments? And you watch it. You can relate because there are times in our own lives where it feels like God is silent because horrible things happen. And we ask the question, God, where are you? Whether it's cancer or death or suffering. Um, we ask that question, God, where are you? And I'm here to say, it's, I think it's actually appropriate to ask that question. Because if we're open to hearing the answer, God responds. God responds when we're able to ask that hard question, saying, I'm, I've come to the end of myself. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. God, I need you now. And I feel like we need to give ourselves grace, grace in these moments and to be open to hearing the voice of God. So the application for this one is like Elijah and in the movie Silence, or um, like the Rodriguez, the, the priest, it's easy to feel like God has forgotten you, forgotten about us in times of difficulty, like the time we're in now. But give yourself some grace and look for God's presence around you. My point number two then is God does not always operate in the realm of the spectacular. God does not always operate in the realm of the spectacular. Verse nine says, then he came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Again, Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. Elijah has just seen God rain fire down on those that would speak against God. And he is not sure God, he doesn't believe God essentially has the power to protect him. And I, I feel like we can relate to this. It points to a common belief that maybe God doesn't have my best interest at heart. Maybe God is distant and really can't protect me or is not with me when I'm struggling with anything in life. When we get to verse 11, it says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. As Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. A mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. He went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, 
What are you doing here, Elijah? I believe God was giving Elijah an object lesson in this moment. Let me remind you, Elijah, of my power. Although you just saw it 40 days ago, let me remind you what I have control over. And he experiences these three fantastic scenes, wind, earthquake, and fire. And the common factor with all three of them is if you've ever been in a windstorm or a tornado or a hurricane, or you've been in a fire, or you've been in an earthquake, the common factor in all of them is you have no control. There is nothing, you cannot stop the wind. You cannot stop the fire, and you cannot stop the ground from shaking. I grew up in California. I mean, I, I, before moving to Oregon, I learned, I used to call it Northern California, but I realized people in Redding don't like that when you say Northern California. But I grew up in the Bay Area, south of in a little town called Santa Cruz, and it was on a fault line. And I remember clearly over and over the ground shaking. Uh, one of the most memorable moments was during, um, in junior high, we had this long concrete, you know, walkway where students would walk down um, between classes. It was lunchtime, and we were all sitting out there, and out of the blue, we could feel something moving, and we could see down at the end of the walkway, the, uh, my fellow students were higher than I was. You literally could see the roll of the earth as it moved by you. And as a junior high student, you thought it was awesome. At the same time, I was terrified because everything you know about an earthquake, everything you think is solid is now not solid. You realize in that moment, the world is not as solid as you think, as we are also experiencing right now. How could a virus shut down our country? How could a virus affect our country in a way that churches would not gather across the country on Sunday? It feels a little bit out of control. And we ask the same question, what can we really do? We're taking precautions, and we should take precautions. But what can we really do? I don't know if there's any toilet paper hoarders here. I've got to be honest, I, 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 I don't understand it. Maybe if you're that person, come talk to me after the service. I just don't understand it, because everything else is so much more perishable than toilet paper. And I have seen, I have been into a couple markets, and sure enough, the market wasn't full, but the toilet paper section was gone. It was empty. And I was just with a friend of mine who's a scientist, and um, he uh, and an engineer, and he was working, uh, he's worked with virologists for years here in Seattle. And he, I asked him, I said, Jeff, why do you think all the toilet paper's gone? He goes, I think people feel helpless. And somehow it's become the thing you can do. It becomes the thing that I can somehow take control because we're striving for control. But if you're a person of faith, you realize we don't have control. And when God comes and passes by in fire and earthquake and wind, I think he's essentially saying, I'm reminding you, I have power over all these things. Because in the ancient Near East, those were the, if you could control the water or the wind, that was the fearful moment. That we said when Jesus is on the boat. They are truly frightened when Jesus can calm the water. But then, God comes and says, I'm not in these things. I can control these things. But he comes in this little whisper. In Hebrew, it's a thin sound. And he hears the voice of God. Now, the challenge is, what, and what's interesting about the story is God is speaking clearly to Elijah. And we can read the story and become frustrated in our faith because we may not hear that whisper like the voice of God. I don't know about you, but I ask people all the time when they say, I heard God's voice. I'll tell you what I found out. There's no consistent answer. I've met very few people that have said, I hear God's audible voice all the time and he answers all my questions. Rather, it is a process. There are people that have said, I've heard God's voice, but it's few and far between, like an audible voice. But I have heard God's voice in the community in scripture, in singing a song, in a sunset, in a painting, in a person that brought me food. That's how people often hear the voice of God. And it often comes like that, like a whisper or a movement or a meal or a kindness and not in the earthquake. So the call then here is to trust God. Elijah, it brings him, when God meets with Elijah in this whisper, it brings him out of his discouragement and it brings him out of his lethargy. 
And God gives him a new commission. He says, you're now going to go do something. Gives him purpose in his life. He's got something for him. And I say that because I think the church has an opportunity right now. God's got something for us as the larger church. What do you have for us in these moments? Now, I'm not telling you to not take precautions, but historically, the church, the early Christians, during the Black Death, we have records of everyone leaving the cities in Europe. And you know who stayed? You know who went back into the cities? It's Christians, to their own peril. I'm not telling you to die. But I'm also saying there's an opportunity for the church to rise up here and be what God's called us to be. God has something for Elijah, and God has something for the world, and God has something for you. Insert your name here. God sometimes works in these big, bold miracles, but more often, I see him work as a whisper, as a voice, as a song, as a sunset. And it takes time to show. It often takes time to see. We don't hear that instantaneous voice you've been a person of faith for any amount of time, you've realized God often speaks over a longer period of time. But the answer was there. Um, are we going to be able to show this picture? I have a picture. Um, I'm not an art major. I was never an art major. Um, I appreciate art. Um, my, mo- my grandmother had some paintings. Uh, uh, if I say the term Nihonga, uh, a Nihonga painting, a Jap- uh, it's a form of Japanese art. If we get it, great. If not, but you can look it up. Um, but Nihonga um, paintings, or paintings involve the big brush strokes. Yes, yes, great. Um, and uh, when, when someone's painting in the style, they're painting big brush strokes, but in the painting, there's crushed up minerals. There's often gold or silver, and it's a laborious work. They're laborious, it, it, it takes quite a bit of time to uh, create the painting. Um, But what's fascinating about the paintings is that over time, because they have minerals, the painting begins to change. And they come out from underneath, and you begin to see the brush strokes, and it becomes a different painting. As artist Fujimara uh, understands, that it's what's on the surface um, is not what will be there forever. That over time, you get something else. And when we're looking for an answer... It time seems to be the factor is over time. God is always faithful, but he's not always instantaneously faithful. The answer we want to hear in this moment. Sometimes, yes. Often it's just being patient with God. Like these paintings sometimes we see on the surface, like life's painful moments, it won't be there forever, and God will show through. So the application here is when our problems don't seem to be answered, we can be tempted to think that God has vanished. We limp through the desert, believing we've been abandoned. God wears the wind. God wears the earthquake. God wears the fire. God wears the healing. God wears the miracle. But God, I'm here to tell you, God has not abandoned us in this moment, in our country, in our world. He has not left the building. He is absolutely here. And he will whisper in a mountain, in a view of a mountain or a, a piece of art or a passage or a song or a person or a sermon. God is not silent, even though it seems like it sometimes. And then for the third part, I, I want to say this, and this is quite a bit shorter. Don't believe the lie that says you have to face your problems on your own. Don't believe the lie that you have to gut this out and face these problems on your own. When Elijah heard Heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came, travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint um, Hazazel to be king of Aram. And I'm going to skip down to the very end there. He gives us some directions. But then look at verse 18. He says, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel. 7,000. Now, Elijah just felt like there was no one available. He said, I'm the last prophet. I'm the last one who's been faithful to you. And God says, no, I've got a plan. And I know who's faithful. And guess what? I'm giving you a number. There are 7,000 faithful who have never 
bowed down to Baal or kissed him. You see, where he is right now in Horeb, Sinai Peninsula, is where God met Moses and gave, gave his people the covenant. And what God is, is he's reestablishing and reminding Elijah of his covenant, that he is faithful. And bringing him there, I'm sure Elijah would have remembered the stories that he had grown up with and been recited and he had memorized. And he goes, I am in this place where God initially called us out as a people. And so he goes, we don't need, we, he says, don't, Elijah, you are not alone in this. I have others. Now, American sensibilities, we wrestle with this because we, we believe we should gut it out and do it on our own. And I think one of the most powerful things that the church has to offer in the future is community. It's weird saying that online to a small group of people. I, and there's not a lot of things that I will stand on and say, I know this for sure, but I do know this for sure, that being together and being face-to-face and walking the journey is what God, one of the, one of the reasons he created the church. Because you're going to be my people called out together to make the journey together. Because there's going to be moments when your faith is stretched and you're going to need someone to come alongside you and walk with you and, and, and grieve with you and cry with you and be silent as they sit and listen to you as you rally or, or you rage against God and are frustrated. But they're, they're going to be faithful and they're going to be close to you. It's not going to be a screen. It's going to be a person. Um, Maria Abramovic, performance artist, at the New York um, New York Museum of Modern Art. And um, you can see her, go to YouTube, you can look up her name. I don't have a video, I apologize. But if you look up her name, she is a performance artist that went to the museum, uh, New York Museum of Modern Art. And essentially, she sat, put a table out and sat down at the table and invited people to come in and sit across the table from her. She didn't say anything. She had no facial expressions. She wasn't trying to be expressive with anything she did on her face. She just sat. And people lined up for hours to sit across from her. And you can watch in some of the videos, people get up, leaving the table after a couple minutes, weeping. A.O. Scott in his book, he describes this, um, and he says, people line up for hours for the chance to sit across from Abramovic for about 30 seconds. What many people find bizarre is that there were scores of individuals who left. The artist is present. It was called the artist is present. In tears, overcome with emotion at Abramovic's gaze, they couldn't help but weep. And then Scott says, A.O. Scott says in his book, he says, the attraction Abramovic, ex- by the, uh, Abramovic extended exerted simply by announcing and sustaining her presence was perhaps a measure of and a temporary anecdote to the profound alienation we feel from one another and from ourselves. What does it say to us that we have, we have to go to an art museum to find connection with another soul? It is powerful when you see it happen. And I raise this question because I, again, this is, this is the hill that I'm going to die on and stand on saying we were created for community. We were created to be in a space with other people, to walk the journey together. What's happening with this virus is it's separating us away from, from being in the present. And that's healthy and it's good. And it's wise right now to slow the spread. And I would say the church now has the opportunity to step in and be the church God's calling us to be. I don't know exactly what that means, but I know there's a need. If people were already feeling alienated before this morning or before this week, imagine now when people aren't even going to knock on a door or pick up a phone because, um, or, 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 or greet someone with a smile because they're afraid of what might happen. So with that said, I think we need to be asking those churches right away, questions right away. What does it look like for this community here? What does it look like for the wider church community to step in in these moments and provide community? I am not saying you need to go up and embrace someone in this moment, but there are people in your neighborhoods, around this church, around the neighborhood you live, that were already isolated, and now 
almost have lost all hope. And maybe the whisper of God in their life, if they're asking the questions, God, where are you? Is the person that knocks on their door and leaves a piece of paper that says, do you need anything? Here is my phone number. I'm going to go to the market. I'm not as at risk as you might be because of a compromised immune system or your age. I'm not as at risk, but um, I want to be available if you need anything. Um, six weeks. That's what my friend said. Schools are closed for six weeks in this area. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. That creates so many issues. But there is an opportunity to ask the bigger questions about our own faith right now. Maybe God has given us the opportunity to slow down and focus on what's important. To pick up the phone and call people. You know, the phones actually make phone calls. Do you know that? You can do more than send a picture and send a text. You can actually call people. Why not use this opportunity to make some phone calls during the day saying, I was just, I'll walk you through it. Hey, I'm just, was thinking about you. You just came to mind. I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. I'm just checking in to see how you're doing today. You know, and if, it, if God leads you, just maybe the next day you call him again or the next week. Go to your neighbors and maybe we're going to start an online book group. And every other day we're going to figure out technology and, and if, if you're someone that's really good at technology, maybe you're the person that's going to drive that and say, if anyone has questions how to connect um, via video, call me. Maybe that's the way you're going to help. And so we can start getting face-to-face and connect with, with one another. Because you've got a whole generation of people that are, were isolated and had some connection on Sunday morning, and now that's gone away. And maybe we can create some space where people can just even have that voice connection until this, this time has passed. There is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for the church to rise up. And I don't, I don't find anywhere in the Bible where it says we have the opportunity to sit back on this one and watch it go past. I don't, I don't understand the Bible that way. I don't see in any way where we can just say, write it out alone. But I think we need to be asking the question, how can we care for the lost and the least and the poor and the broken in these moments? And in conclusion, let me say this. Uh, I talked about we need a reminder. We often need reminders of what God's done. And, and often we can rack our brain and say, well, what's, where's God showing up in my life? I, we don't even have to go there. We have the greatest story ever about, of, of God's presence as he came down in human form in the story of Jesus. That becomes a story. And as we, as we move through Lent, that becomes a story we need to read over and over and over again. And let that be a reminder of how faithful God is. Rather than, rather than leaving us to die in our own sin, Jesus came to earth to redeem us and death could not keep him down. When times are difficult and we struggle to hear God's voice, we can find hope and peace looking to the person of Christ. For those struggling today, I challenge you to take, heart, take, take time and reflect on God's grace um, in these troubling times. Let's pray. God, I feel as people are coming to the end of themselves, maybe even in this room or people watching this, for the first time are coming to a space where hope seems beyond their reach. So God, we are going to trust your words and trust that what you have, what you have written what we've experienced is true, that you love your children, that you are concerned, that you're moving, that you're involved. And you you have throughout history invited your church to be your hands and your feet. So God, um, I pray for those that are at the end, that you would in, you it, maybe you need to come in a fire, maybe it's a small whisper, but... Um, I pray that you would restore and renew or maybe offer for the first time hope that is beyond hope. Um, I pray for those that are on the front line uh, of this, that are are consistently putting themselves in harm's way, that you would protect them and encourage them, sustain them. We pray for healing and restoration for those that are broken this morning. 
because of uh, this virus. So God, guide us. Holy Spirit, lead us into places that you're calling us to go so that we can be your church to your people. So, Jesus, we pray this in your name. Um, because of your death and resurrection, we hold it all to be true. Amen.